Hello, and welcome to another edition of Lodging on Demand. In this episode, Lodging Editor-in-Chief Dennis Nessler sits down with Monica Nesbach, Principal and Chief Creative Officer at Design Bar, and Peter Mack, Founder and CEO of Collective Retreats, to discuss some of the latest trends and best practices in sustainability within both traditional hotels and nature-based properties. The duo also discusses how the U.S. lodging industry has fared relative to other countries and where those efforts can be enhanced going forward. Hi, this is Dennis Nessler, Editor-in-Chief of Lodging Magazine. Welcome to today's video on demand. We're going to talk a little bit about sustainability initiatives today, and we have a couple of industry experts uh, to to uh, expand on, on some of those uh, issues. We have Monica Nesbach, Principal Chief Creative Officer for Design Bar, and we have Peter Max, CEO and founder of Collective Retreats. How are you doing, guys? Doing great. Thank you so much. Doing, having doing us. great. How are you, Dennis? <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Thanks so much for being with us today. Um, wanted to maybe just start and talk a little bit about how sustainability has evolved and and some of the changes that you've seen with regards to your businesses. Um, Peter, you want to get us started? Yeah. Thanks, Dennis. Um, it's a really exciting time, actually, with regards to how sustainability has evolved, because I think one thing that has changed significantly in the last year, a couple of years, is I think that people are really meaningfully starting to see through kind of the inauthentic side of sustainability and see through it to the <clears throat> real and authentic side. And so I think one of the, the most exciting trends in sustainability is that um, consumers, guests in our hotels, travelers are really thoughtfully seeking sustainability and not not in sort of what I'll call the old school way, which is, you know, don't refresh your towels every night kind of thing, but in much more deep, meaningful, authentic ways. And I'm, I'm pretty excited about that. Yeah. 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 I, I would agree with that. Uh, what, when you, when you say uh, maybe some, some better examples of authentic um, Peter, if you wouldn't mind uh, in terms of, you mentioned the towels, but what are some of the the more authentic things that you see now that are really having an impact? Yeah. Well, I, I think particularly in our corner of the industry, which, which we consider nature-based hospitality, um, consumers are really flocking to um, experiences that don't just bring them to a vacation place that could connect them to nature, but actually seeking to stay in nature. And when you're literally staying in nature, staying in a you know small cabana um, on a beachfront kind of jungle experience or in the mountains or whatever it may be, um, you, you become really attuned to the impact that the property is having on nature, right? When when you can actually see wildlife and feel the wind, as opposed to just open a balcony that looks out to a beach, um, you really become attuned to certain things. So that I think that that really goes from the core to the extremities. And at the core, things like um, responsible use of water, uh, responsible waste management, as you get to the extremities, it really has to do with where food is sourced, um, how daily practices impact flora and fauna and wildlife, how oceans are treated by hotel guests and hotel um, staff team product and experience. I think, I really think it runs the gamut. But one of the things that we're really seeing that I mentioned before is that guests really want to immerse themselves in nature. And I think that when you truly immerse someone in a natural environment, right, not just in a 20 story hotel that has a really nice beach view or mountain view. Um, you actually feel the connection to nature and by feeling it really in tangible ways, you really see how small things make big impacts. Sure. Monica, how about you? Sure. I mean, I feel for it from the interior, interior design perspective, um, you know, that drives also drives the demand, right? Uh, because more eco-friendly or sustainability and, you know, conscious, um, consumers also demand um, those those type of uh, authentic <laughs> surroundings, right? From a material perspective, construction materials, interior materials, fabrics, like everything that we use. And it's it's really interesting because we, we've, we've kind of shifted gears from having uh, a client uh, um, or us 
proposing sustainable materials to clients versus the client actually asking for it, which is great, you know, because I mean, that that was the first thing that was usually value engineered. And now it's actually something that's being asked for, and you know, is, is, is being requested. So it's great. We love we love seeing that. How, how much? Um... Is it the majority of projects at this point, Monica, that you'd say that, that they're requesting? I wish. I hope it's going to go in this direction. Oh. <laughs> no, unfortunately not. But I mean, we just signed a huge um, adaptive reuse project in Oregon that's going to be completely, um, you know, sustainable. Um, Peter, <laughs> you guys have, have B Corp status, I believe. Um, we do. A little bit about what that means, how you get it, uh, how, do you, how you attain it and what that really means. Yeah, absolutely. Um, B Corp status is something that we're really proud of because in, it's, it doesn't really exist much in the travel and hotel industry. So we were sort of the the first and largest um, global um, brand, specific. I mean, especially in nature based hospitality, but really across the industry to have this kind of designation. And I'll tell you what it means for us um, regarding the process. We had to go through so collective retreats. The the brand is ten years old now, and over you know we've attained the B Corp status a couple of years ago. We had to go through a significant process um, to obtain it. Um, the B Corp process involves potentially years of um, reporting, inspections, um, you know, a whole bunch of requirements that you have to satisfy, and some of that required us to actually do better than we were doing. So for example, we weren't um, providing, a, we didn't have a perfect plan for providing certain workforce um, spaces around needs for pregnant and breastfeeding mothers. And we actually improved ourselves to do that. Some of it had to do with core environmental impact stuff like, um, you know, like water usage and energy usage, although collective retreats was pretty good in that sense. But we went through a couple of years process of both improving our quality on certain areas of impact and measurement. It takes years to measure these things, not just weeks or months. And um, the B Corp B Labs, which is the company that supervises B Corp, has a very stringent um, process for certification. And we were proud to qualify a couple of years ago. Um, what really made the biggest difference, though, for me, Dennis, and, and actually the reason why we decided to pursue B Corp status was I, I struggled in a world where there's a lot of greenwashing. I struggled with authenticity. Um, whether it was our own team members or our guests, we were often said, you guys, you know, collective retreats, you keep telling us, either guests or our own team members or partners, that what you're doing is so helpful for the environment and so sustainable, prove it, right? And um, every company has the ability to say they're doing things that are environmentally friendly, and every company has the ability to measure those things by bringing in an outside, very well-respected um, organization to certify for it, we were able to authentically prove it. And it really created a higher level of commitment, morale, <clears throat> engagement from our staff, and something that I think our guests really appreciate that when we say that what we're doing is has quality impact and is sustainable, that we can actually mean it with a really like sort of gold seal of approval on it. So those those were kind of the ways that we thought about it. Monica, um... One of the things that I you know was always kind of hampered uh, the progress of sustainability is uh, that it was cost prohibitive. Have you seen it change in terms of product cost? Um, any anything in terms of of just the investment on the owner's part uh, in terms of of going to green? I mean, I feel like the cost has definitely not changed, <laughs> especially now in times where where it costs actually is going up. But um, with having a higher cost in the front end, I think you do have savings on the back end. And also, you know, coming from the perspective that the consumer is actively demanding um, materials or like being in an environment that promotes wellness, um, I think there's the ROI right there, you know. Um, I, I, it's it's coming from from that perspective. What do your clients want to see? Um, where do what they want to live in? And then also um, your your own conscious as a as an owner, right? <laughs> like what do you what do you stand for? Um, so I think the higher cost up front definitely is is offset by um, you know a higher demand uh, on the other side. So yeah, 
Uh, Peter, what what have you seen in recent years? Uh, anything in particular, uh, any innovation um, from a sustainability perspective that you're keeping an eye on or that you you think has kind of moved the needle a little bit uh, from your perspective? Yeah, um, I think there's some really exciting um, trends, maybe not so much innovations, but certainly trends in dining and dining experiences where I'd say that really finally the consumer and and where the industry can be are kind of meeting up. So I, I've been finding that um, some of our, our culinary team chefs, some of the guest chefs that we work with have been really creative in terms of how they're um, sustainably sourcing and creating really brilliant dishes in different ways than maybe five years ago or two years ago or three years ago. I think that that might be, you know, a little bit of an outcome and product of COVID and people having a little more... Um, thought about where their food is coming from and things like that. I think that's an exciting part of the industry. I think we're starting to see some really exciting um, advancements in transportation, right? And I mean, like right around our properties, whether it be um, some of the super efficient e-bikes that are now starting to come onto the market or especially vehicles, you know, EVs have really come to be much more viable just in recent years. Um, those are a couple of places that we're seeing it most uh, in in like the last two three years. Yeah, Monica, how about how about your perspective on that? Um, of course, I mean there's a lot of um, advancement in recycled materials or fibers that are being used. Of course, you know in, in fabrics, and they've all they also have come a long way in terms of performance. Um, a lot of them are performance fabrics, um, recycled content. We also run now into issues where um, people that are promoting recycled, you know, using recycled materials or recycling recycled plastics, they actually run into the issue of not getting the resources anymore because there's not much available anymore. Yeah. So I've I've had a conversation with one of our vendors where they had to reduce their recycled content because they they just couldn't get the materials anymore. Monica, you mentioned um, you you grew up in Germany. I'm just curious your perspective on kind of how the U.S. is doing uh in in this area versus maybe some countries overseas and maybe i mean have you worked at all overseas or, you know just any perspective you might be able to give on that yeah um <laughs> do you want the honest answer <laughs> it's okay the honest answer yes well, okay truth, nothing but the truth so i i, I mean i feel that the united states is is catching up is definitely catching up but, but has not have put the emphasis on you know, recycling and being environmentally conscious as other countries have. Um, of course, growing up in Europe, you grow up in, in a much, much smaller, you know, sc- scope of people with much more people in a closer environment. So, you know, there's there's less space, whereas the United States has way, way more space and all these, the same amount of people distributed over way more amount of space. Um, I was very surprised when I came here that I didn't have to separate any trash. Nobody was ever talking about trash separation. <laughs> I think there's there's definitely catching up and the the overall movement is there for the to to be conscious about the environment and what we leave behind for our children and for our future generations um and I love seeing that so I think I think that there's the 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 trend is going in the right direction. <laughs> yeah, Peter, you agree? Yeah, I think the US is behind, you know, from my <clears throat> right now we primarily operate in the United States but obviously we get um, collective retreats as part of our conservatory collective portfolio. We have um, just under a hundred properties around the world that we have affiliated with and have created a brand for um, eco travel and nature based travel experiences. And so we have a lot of communication and insight and best practice sharing. And I think one of the things I, I definitely agree that the that North North America, in particular the United States, is behind. Um, one of the things that we have that gives me some hope is we tend to be really good at technological innovation here. And I have seen a lot of good technology that has Mm -hmm. been helpful. Generally speaking, it doesn't represent, um, us doing the real nuts and bolts work of becoming much more sustainable, but it does have the power to, um, educate people in such ways that, that they will want to become more thoughtful in their practices and behaviors. And so, you know, we've seen a lot with like in-room technology, our latest, our latest rooms have really um, energy use management technology, water technology, Um, even in particular, when, when um, Monica talks about materiality, you know, 
there's really cool technology happening in the building industry around um, passive energy design, yeah. roofing, Your siding, thermal. insulation. And I yeah. think some of that stuff is exciting. And I do see some of that innovation coming from the United States. I don't see the kind of guest practices side and consumer behaviors um, as prevalently as we do in other places like certain places in Africa and Europe and um, other locations. Yeah. I feel like there's a lot of examples set by other countries as well, like to, when it comes to retreats and, and resorts or eco resorts as well, where, you know, those practices are being, or those technologies are being used, uh, smart yeah. technologies in particular. You're correct though. I feel like COVID has kind of helped to push it in that, that direction as well. Cause everybody it was really has. inside and really was, I think for the first time feeling that we need a connection to nature because, because we didn't have it or most people didn't have it because they were sitting in yeah. their house. Right. And so I think that really was driving people to be more conscious about like, what does it really do for us and how much of it affects our wellness and, and our well and our behaviors and our, you know, feelings. So I think that that was really drive a driving factor and helpful factor. <laughs> yeah. We, we were worried pre COVID and during, even during COVID, we were worried that, um, People were seeking nature experiences through screens, you know, whether it was VR or yeah. their television or their phone or whatever it may be. I think during COVID, it really jolted most of us or many of us to say, wow, we need to prioritize connection to nature. We're feeling what we call biophilic. We need to prioritize connection to nature in our in our routines, in our monthly or yearly routines. And we're even seeing that, especially with younger people, right? Younger generations and kids. Um, and I think that's really special. And I think that gives me a lot of hope that um, environment or, environmental stewardship will come with it. We, we really think that connecting people to beautiful places and beautiful experiences in nature is the best way to drive environmental stewardship. I love that. <laughs> yeah, that sounds good. Well, appreciate your time today, guys. Uh, lots of great insights for us and uh, appreciate it. And uh, we'll see you down the road. Thank you so much, Dennis. Appreciate Thanks, it. Thanks, Dennis. Thank you for listening to Lodging On Demand. If you would like more content like this, please subscribe to Lodging Magazine on YouTube. You can also subscribe to Lodging On Demand wherever you get your podcasts. For news and updates, follow at Lodging Magazine on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, and X. Or visit us at lodgingmagazine.com.